and welcome to all of you who are joining us for the lecture this afternoon. This is the first program in our series of five events highlighting the treasures of the HUC Library Collection. Okay, so I'm sorry. This is the first program in our series of five events highlighting the treasures of the HUC Library Collection, featuring leading scholars who will share their expertise with us. With over 1 million items, including books, manuscripts, microfilms, maps, board sites, book plates, music scrolls, scrolls stamps, and much more, the HUC libraries have the largest Judaica collection in the Western Hemisphere, hemisphere and is second to, to in size only to the Judaica collection at the National Library of Israel. Joining me today is my friend and colleague, Sharon Lieberman Mintz, one of the preeminent scholars in the fields of illuminated Hebrew manuscripts and rare books. Over the course of 30 years at the JTS Library, she has curated more than 40 exhibitions and authored 10 exhibitions. As a senior consultant for Judaica at Sadebis since 1995, she has cataloged and appraised Hebrew books, Hebrew books and manuscripts for Judaica sales worldwide. Sharon, Sharon's connection with the Cloud Library goes back decades. Hebrew Union College, with help from Sharon, was the forefront of manuscript digitization back in the late 90s. One of the first collections that were digitized were were the Esther scrolls, which Dr. Mintz described, described and cataloged for us with her unique expertise. These descriptions, along with high resolution images, can be found on our beautiful and important manuscript website, mss.huc.edu. Today, Sharon will discuss the history and art of HUC's renowned collection of Esther scrolls created and used for the celebration of Purim, which begins this Thursday night. Please welcome Dr. Mintz. Thank you, Yoram. That was, that was wonderful. Um, it is a pleasure, Abigail and Yoram, to be joining the HUC community again. Uh, in 2017, I was delighted to have the opportunity to catalog the magnificent collection of Esther Scrolls in the HUC Cloud Library. And I would also like to acknowledge the work of my colleague in that cataloging project, Dagmara Bujaj. Um, there are so many exciting scrolls in the HUC Library and it's really wonderful to be able to share some of the highlights of these scrolls with you again today. Uh, the truth of the matter is that the only difficulty in this lecture was figuring out how to narrow down um, to fit in the 50 minutes of this lecture because there are really some such fantastic collection. In the 21st century, much of the world's texts are moving inexorably from codex to tablet. And I don't refer to Moses's tablets, but to the electronic version. This transition is really as seismic as the 15th century introduction of the printing press to the Western world, which jolted book production from the laborious work of manuscripts written one by one to the age of the printed text which made the written word much more widely available. But even as the world moves to a modern electronic format for accessing the written word, there's an ongoing phenomena in Jewish culture that encourages and in fact legislates the obligation to read biblical texts in Hebrew from a scroll on a regular basis. And with this, let me share my screen and start. Okay. And uh, I guess, did that come up properly? Yes? Okay. Yes, uh, I can see that as a yes, unless I hear otherwise. Uh, all right. So um, here we go. The most common scroll associated with Judaism is, of course, the Torah scroll, which you see here on the left. And it comprises the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses. But today I would like to examine another scroll that continues to be produced and utilized by members of the Jewish community, and that's namely the Esther scroll. 
Esther scrolls comprise the biblical book of Esther and are known as Hebrew as a Megillah or Megillat Esther, the plural being Megillot. And this derives from the Hebrew word legalgel, to roll, because um, the book of Esther is then rolled into a cylinder, one cylinder. The book of Esther recounts the miraculous salvation of the Jews of the Persian Empire over their arch enemy Haman some 2,500 years ago. And these scrolls are essential for the annual celebration of the Jewish festival of Purim, which takes place every year in the spring. And of course, this coming Thursday night and Friday here in the diaspora and also on Sunday in Jerusalem because um, they go to the next day. For more than two millennia on the holiday of Purim, Jews have gathered to hear the story of Esther and to read the biblical book of Esther specifically from a scroll. And according to tradition, Esther scrolls must be handwritten in ink on parchment created from the skin of a kosher animal. And it usually consists of several pieces of parchment that are sewn together with sinew. And this scroll is then rolled into one cylinder or around one roller. Um, and frequently a wooden or silver case is um, made to protect the scroll as you see here on the right. Uh, it's Megillah fitted into a silver filigree case. And the rules concerning the writing of Esther scrolls can be found in the Talmud Tractate Megillah and Tractate Sofrim. But Esther scrolls uh, differ from Torah scrolls in several crucial ways. Um, I want to see if I can move my eyes here. Um, number one, um, instead of being mounted on two staves, they're, they're often mounted, they're only mounted on one stave. And number two, um, Esther scrolls are significantly smaller, almost always smaller. But most importantly, um, whereas uh, it is forbidden to add even one extra letter or any decoration whatsoever to a Torah scroll, no such overriding prohibition exists with regard to the Esther scroll. And this is one reason given for the more permissive attitude of the decoration of Esther scrolls. The name of God does not appear even once throughout the text. And as a result, according to rabbinic law, Esther scrolls possess just a smaller, lesser degree of kedusha of holiness than a Torah scroll. And it was therefore deemed acceptable by most rabbinic authorities to add illustrations to the text of the Megillah, and such decorated scrolls are fit for ritual use on Purim. Although most extant Esther scrolls are undecorated, today I would like to draw on the superb collection of the HUC scrolls and present the art and history of a very special group of scrolls, namely those with decorations and illustrations. But to start, I just want to look at one scroll, which is not in the collection of HUC Library, because it is the most important scroll in the world to study decorated Esther scrolls, and that is that it is the first known um, decorated uh, Megillat Esther. And you're looking at it here. Hang on one second. If I do this, does it, um, Abigail, does it make the screen smaller on all of your parts or is it still full screen on yours? It's, it's about half a screen. Half a screen, that's no good. Let's go back to that. Okay, but you still are seeing only my, my slides, is that correct? Yes. Okay, fine, so we'll, we'll just keep going like that. Um, so this, this is an Esther scroll uh, that was written in Venice in 1564, and we're going to examine it uh, more uh, in a moment. Um, and it is in the private collection of Mr. Braginski, who graciously put, on, it put it on exhibition and online so everyone can enjoy it. Um, the Book of Esther has court intrigue, murder, not quite romance, uh, but as we were taught in, in day schools, lots and lots of beauty pageants. Ahasuerus has a new woman coming to amuse him every night for three and a half years. And you can do the math on that. That's about 1,300 women. He has nonstop parties that last 180 days. So it's not really surprising that this story sparked the imagination of artists around the world. And it's interesting that despite the overall tacit rabbinic acceptance of illustrated Esther scrolls, the first dated and decorated Esther scroll only appears in the second half of the 16th century. And you're looking at it, it was produced in 1564. 
And we know this because there is a colophon at the end. This is an end note containing scribal information. Um, and you see it here um, all the way to the left. And it gives us detail of how this scroll uh, was made. I'm going to make this just a tiny drop smaller so I can <clears throat> go back and forth. Let's see if I can. How's that? Does that fill up most of the screen still? OK. Yeah, looks good. Yes, but we see only the F of the colophon. Now it's OK. OK. Is that, that about right? Yes. OK. Uh, let me see if I can make this a little bit larger. Um, Karen, it's OK. We can I'd read like to it. make this full screen, but um, not 100% sure how. OK. It's, I think this will work. Um, in the colophon, we read that this scroll was written by a female scribe, Stalina, the daughter of the honorary officer Menachem, the son of the chief honorary officer Yucutiel, in the city of Venice on Tuesday, the third day of Adar, the 16th of February, in the year 5,324. And you can see that over here. And um, that equals 1564. And while the rabbis of the Talmud did not permit women to serve as scribes and create uh, ritual objects such as Torah scrolls, the traditional rabbinic standpoint is less definite as to whether women may write Esther scrolls. And this has to do with the question of whether women are obligated in the mitzvah, not obligated, and they can write scrolls and they can't. But Stalina is clearly the scribe of this scroll and she is only one of three women known to have written Esther scrolls prior to the 20th century. And she was clearly a very wealthy and educated woman. And I have been trying to pin her down to exactly who she is historically. And I have not been able to do so. And it is extremely <laughs> annoying. Um, uh, uh, in fact, we even have a coat of arms here, a family crest, um, which uh, indicates it's a crown over two fish, and it indicates that uh, she may have been a member of the Castelfranco family. While the Jews of Italy were not granted formal coats of arms by the ruling authorities, Jewish families adopted the custom of, uh, of creating and using their own insignias. Um, and they used these informal family emblems on personal items, uh, as well as on Judaica they commissioned, such as marriage contracts, synagogue textiles, um, silver ceremonial objects of Judaica, book bindings, and as you see here, Esther scrolls. Um, the decorative scheme on this scroll is a format that's going to become standard. The text is set within uh, ornamental arches. Let's see, let's... Uh, we can go back to this, you see that here. And um, we see uh, floral motifs and uh, the artistic vocabulary really reflects the 16th century interest in Greco-Roman imagery. We have masks on top, urns, um, caryatids, uh, and you see that, let's see, over here on the right, caryatids are female figures that um, serve as architectural support. And we also see satyrs. These are woodland deities. Do you see that in this, in this on the right over here, these two satyrs? Um, and they are attendants of Bacchus and they're part goat and part human. And they are very well known for representing lasciviousness. Um, satyrs are suggestive of lust and seduction. It's really an extremely risque imagery to include on a ceremonial object used to fulfill a mitzvah. Um, but perhaps not out of context for the very raucously celebrated holiday of Purim. So today, uh, as we explore um, the examples of the art of decorated Esther scrolls, I want you to notice that there is no one unique style that emerges. Rather, we're going to find that the Jews adapted and adopted the art of the country in which they lived so that the Jews of Italy are employing the decorative imagery that you would have found in, uh, in Italy in the 16th century. Um, and uh, the Jews of Morocco don't use any figural images at all. Um, and, and we're gonna see how this emerges as we continue onward. So the style is going to vary from country to country and period to period. 
Now, some of you may be thinking that the date of this scroll, 1564, is quite late for the appearance of the first decorated Esther scroll. And you would be right, um, because we certainly have decorated Hebrew codices from centuries earlier, the 11th century Bibles that are decorated from the Far East, for example. Scholars are really uncertain for the reason of the late appearance of decorated Esther scrolls in the field of Jewish art. And it is really worthwhile to note that even undecorated Esther scrolls cannot be dated securely before the late 15th century. Um, so some of you may have seen uh, the news that went around that the National Library of Israel was just gifted a scroll that dates the, from the Iberian Peninsula that dates the 15th century. And the way that it was dated was they actually sent in, or the, 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 the donor sent in, a piece to be carbon dated and it came back circa 1465 plus minus 20 years. Um, the earliest undecorated but dated Esther scroll is only from 1483, and that is really quite late. It's a scroll in the Parma Library. So, um, yeah. You have just seen um, examples of Stalina's scroll, the first decorated scroll. And now what I want to show you is uh, scrolls from the HUC collection. And there are only two examples of decorated scrolls from the 16th century. Stalinas and this one here, which is a printed border with the text of the Megillah written in by hand. Um, and this is a, a scroll in, in the Clow Library. And the scroll, the border was printed on parchment and it's decorated with an exquisite copper plate uh, border uh, engraved onto the parchment. And the border was designed by Andrea Morelli. And he was a Christian printmaker and a book illustrator who was active in Rome from 1567 to 1572. And while he was in Rome, Morelli produced a series of engraved decorative frames for the calligraphic alphabet of a man by the name of Giovanni Cresci. And Cresci was one of the most famous Italian calligraphers of the 16th century. And in 1570, he created an alphabet which was published with the borders of Morelli. And the alphabet was called El Perfetto Scrittore, the Perfect Scribe. And it was published in Rome in 1570. And you are looking at the title page of this album on the screen. And that's actually a picture of Morelli in front of you. The scholar Eva Framjevic's research has revealed that the decorative frames that Morelli created for Cresci's alphabet and um, here you see here, whoops, excuse me one minute, the frame for the letter H, right? Okay, look carefully at that, were reused to adorn the borders of an Esther scroll. And I want you to um, notice over here the sort of putti on top and uh, these grimacing um, atlas figures, these sort of half men, half columns. And I want you to notice also the um, the dogs and the grimacing masks. And then take a look at this scribe here, this uh, slide here, and you will see um, exactly the same imagery, right? Um, so what happened was this decorated uh, frame was made for Morelli's, by Morelli uh, for Cresci's book of the alphabet. And then after the alphabet book was printed in Rome in 1570, a printer, we don't know who, used the very same decorative frames to print and embellish sheets of parchment, which a scribe then wrote in the text of the Mikilab by hand. So um, number one, we see they're using the frames to the letter H. And here's the letter S. OK, and look at this incredible frame. I and mean, here you have this woman. She's kind of this sculptural woman. And, and she's feeding this child below from her breasts. I mean, it's, it's just a, a really an incredible image. And um, here you see that very same image uh, being used for the Megillah. Um, although, the, although it's a printed border, so you might think, well, you know, like printed books, we would find many of these uh, scrolls still extant. Um, printing on parchment is costly and complicated. When you print on parchment, when you print on paper, you need to wet the surface um, and then print, and then, and then you, you, you put down the printing press on it. And when you wet parchment, the whole thing sort of 
you know, changes. And uh, parchment is expensive, much more expensive than paper. And so it's a costly endeavor. And uh, you needed a lot of expertise to be able to print on parchment. And in fact, there are only three known examples of this Esther scroll border um, from the late 16th century. And um, one is the HUC scroll in the Clow Library. Uh, the British Library has one, and one is in a private collection in Zurich. Uh, and of course, you're looking at the example from the Clow Library now. The advantage of a printed border is that by using them, the scribe could significantly decrease the time it took to take uh, to create a beautiful scroll. And this uh, translated into a reduction in the cost of the scroll and you could have more buyers and you know sort of sell more scrolls. So it was kind of a marketing effort on, on the part of printers um, to create things that scribes and people would buy. And then the scribes also like to use printed borders as well. However, um, the printed border uh, that we are looking at and both printed borders, fascinating as they are, bear no relationship to the Esther story. Um, it's important to note that none of the Esther scrolls from the 16th century contain figures or narrative screen scenes that relate to the biblical story. And the transition from decorated, just purely decorated Esther scrolls to illustrated Esther scrolls, where we have scenes from the story, doesn't occur until the early 17th century. But before we get to illustrated scrolls, I want to take you back to... Um, one more scroll in the collection of the HUC library. And that is another extremely early scroll. Um, and it was created in Modena in 1606. And we know this because if you see, there is an inscription over here where the scribe uh, tells us where and when he wrote it. So let's look at that uh, a minute close up. Okay, we see that here. And it says here, Ani Yehoshua, right, hold on one second. Ani Yehoshua ben Laudani av Hanale Shmuel Sanguini. Um, it might be Sanguini, it might be Sanguinetti, two, two families. Evarech et asher na'ale l'chtov ha-mikila hazod. I bless that the, the, he, God, who, who allowed me to write this scroll. And he says, he hopes that Hashem um, Yizakeni Likrotba, may God merit that I read from it, I and my children and my children's children. And he says, and I wrote it here in the city of Modena in the month of Shvat, in the year, uh, and he uses a chronogram. A chronogram is a, a verse with letters highlighted. And these letters, equal the year 5,366, which if you add it up quickly, comes to 1606. Uh, and above that, we see uh, the uh, family emblem of the Sanguinetti uh, and probably Sanguini family as well, which is a wolf that stands next to a verdant tree. So we have here some of the elements that we find on Italian Esther scrolls, a coat of arms, an inscription, telling us when and where it was made. And then if we take a minute, what we see is that there, the scroll is decorated with uh, text columns uh, that, uh, with text that was written within uh, architectural frames. Um, and, the, and the text is separated by these pillars entwined with flowers and foliage. And uh, uh, just a word about uh, Joshua uh, Sanguini. He was a member of a very wealthy family of merchants and bankers uh, who were active in Modena from the 16th to the 19th century. And so wealthy were they that they even established a private synagogue in Modena. And this is something that only the most affluent families uh, were allowed to do. Uh, it generally, you, you, it was frowned upon to create that sort of a, 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 a private synagogues unless you could pay the community enough money for the privilege. Um, so the scroll is decorated with a decept deceptively uh, a simple running arcade, uh, which enframes each column of text. We have elaborate tortile Corinthian columns wrapped with flowers that are surmounted with pots of flowering plants, and they're topped with a, a pediment, this triangular gable. 
And architectural imagery is a very common motif used to decorate Esther scrolls. We'll see a lot of it in the slides to come. And I've been thinking about it quite a bit. Why did they choose architectural imagery to embellish Megillot? Well, uh, when we read the book of Esther, we find that an enormous amount of attention is paid to space throughout the story. You could almost say that space, lo location, and architecture really frame the story itself. The book of Esther begins with a party, and the space uh, in which this party takes place is described in luxurious detail um, to show the power and the wealth of the king. It, it talks about how there were hangings of white cotton and blue wool caught up with cords of fine linen and purple wool and the hangings are on silver rods hung between alabaster columns and couches of gold and silver and a pavement of marble and alabaster and mother of pearl. I mean, the whole thing is, is totally over the top, showing the power and wealth of the king. Vashti is called from her space to the king's space. And when she refuses to come, she is summarily removed from her kingship. Um, more, basically all the important uh, plot points take place Bisha'ar HaMelech at the palace gates. Moses waits outside the palace gates and he's sitting there. He overhears a plot to kill the king. He doesn't bow down to Haman as he's sitting at the palace gates. He sits there to mourn when he hears the news of the Jews impending doom. And to take it one step further, the rules of who can enter the king's royal chamber are so clearly demarcated. You entered unbidden at the peril of your life. I mean, Esther basically says, I can't go in there, I'll be killed, I'll be killed. And Mordechai says, well, you know, <laughs> you better get with the program. And so she agrees. Um, and it's perhaps not so surprising that so many Esther scrolls are decorated with architectural motifs and themes, seeing how central this is. It's kind of embedded, the whole story revolves around it. But something else to consider, um, is that um, beginning in the early 16th century, architectural imagery plays an enormous role in the decoration of title pages of Hebrew books. They act as an end, a printed books. They act as an a, a, a entry portal to the story. And here on the left, I wanna show you, I think it's one of the very first um, architectural title pages. And it was printed by Daniel Bamberg, the title page to the Talmud Yerushalmi, printed in 1523 in Venice. Um, there's another work that Daniel Bamberg, uh, Hilchos Rav Alfasi, that he also printed in the year 1522 that uses the same imagery. And then Daniel Bamberg, the printer, uses this imagery over and over and over again. And you see the Corinthian capitals, the pediments, the gateway. Um, and uh, on the right, uh, you see this imagery um, from a book from Sabioneta from 1553. This is Moran a philosophical work by Maimonides. And I wanted to point out that the imagery is sort of this architectural gateway, but also um, Mars and Minerva, um, these two um, mythic um, Greek figures are holding up the columns. And there's a whole article about what Mars and Minerva are doing on the title pages of Hebrew books by Marvin Heller, which you can find on academia.edu. Uh, but it's, I just wanted to show you, you might have been surprised about the classical uh, uh, Greek imagery that we saw earlier, and we can see it on the title pages of Hebrew books as well. So perhaps not such a surprise. So, um, Sorry, let me go back here one minute. Um, from Northern Italy, the custom of illustrating Esther scrolls spreads across Europe, um, first to Holland and then to Bohemia, uh, 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 Germany, France, and later in the 19th century, uh, it moves to the Ottoman Empire, to North Africa, Iraq, and Iran. And Amsterdam is the very first place that we find illustrated scrolls. Um, after Italy. And the, um, the city was a leading center of both book production and um, in the 17th and 18th century, the production of Esther scrolls. And what you're looking at here is an Esther scroll with an elaborately engraved border uh, and a handwritten text. And it's the work of the renowned Jewish scribe and artist Shalom de Italia. And Shalom, as his name suggests, uh, was uh, born in Italy, the Italia. Uh, he's from the town of Mantua. And when the Austrian invasion of 1630 forced the Jews from the city, it is believed that Shalom spent some time in Venice and then proceeded to Amsterdam. And uh, Shalom is an artist born to a family of printers. 
And it's not surprising that he begins to craft splendidly decorated Migilot with engraved borders. And this Migilot dates to circa 1641, and it's a superb example of his printed work. Um, the HUC Cloud Library has an example, but I did not have good, um, I did not have good images of that scroll. So instead I'm using the very same uh, printed border um, that is in a scroll in a private collection, but I wanted to give you an idea of what the uh, Kalal Library scroll looks like. And you see here that he's enclosed the text in a highly decorative uh, monumental archway, and he's positioned the characters of the poem story in niches between the portals. Um, and there's no hierarchy here. Uh, what you're looking at are pictures of Esther and Ahasuerus, and uh, there's images of Mordechai and Haman as well. And they're all presented sort of on the same plateau, um, one after the other. And uh, beneath this, we have a series of miniature landscapes beneath the figures. And you see here a close up of a seascape and a hunt scene, which don't appear to be related to the text. And um, in other examples of Shalom Detail's engraved borders, there are actual scenes from the Purim story in these exact cases. Um, in addition, in the opening panel, Shalom Detail has uh, left space for um, a blessings and perhaps for a coat of arms. Here it's blank on this one, but you see his name, he's included it in the uh, engraved uh, border itself, Salom Italia sculpts it, means Salom Italia uh, did this work. Shalom's work exerted considerable influence over the history of Esther scroll decoration and illustrations, and his printed borders circulated widely throughout Western Europe and were frequently copied by other artists in both manuscript and printed format. Um, despite the difficulty of printing on parchment, as I mentioned earlier, parchment doesn't take the ink easily. It's hard to print on parchment. Um, it engenders waste. Parchment is expensive. People don't have that kind of money to be wasting parchment. Um, nevertheless, um, the practice of engraved borders with handwritten test, text witnessed a sizable surge at the beginning of the 18th century as print production became more sophisticated. And here you're looking at um, the Cloud Library scroll printed in Amsterdam um, with elaborately engraved borders. And it's printed at the very beginning of the 18th century. It's not dated, but we know that one of these scrolls, which does have a handwritten date in a private collection, is dated 1701. So we date the rest of them around um, this period. And um, uh, this design was extremely popular. It was reprinted many, many, many times over the course of the 18th century. Uh, and uh, the identity of the engraver is unknown, but the scroll has an unusually large number of illustrations, which makes it particularly interesting. And it's clear that the, either the artist or the patron guiding the artist was extremely knowledgeable because the illustrations include extra biblical material. That is, they include scenes not only from the biblical story, but also additional stories found in the rabbinic narrative known as the Midrash. And the opening of this scroll contains eight scenes, and these are all from the, from the biblical story itself. Um, you see here Esther and uh, Ahasuerus seated with their courtiers around them on top. Uh, you see the handwritten uh, blessings in the center here. Um, Big Tan and Steresh in the center at right uh, hanging. Um, uh, Haman and his 10 sons hanging here. Uh, below, uh, Mordechai waits outside the palace gates. Uh, Hatach is bringing him clothing uh, so he can enter. Haman leading Mordechai on a horse, and Esther and Mordechai um, writing uh, the uh, story down and sending it out. Um, and you see in the first column of text, uh, a banquet scene over here. This is Ahasuerus's banquet. And above there are a series of landscapes. Again, these do not seem to be uh, particularly related to the text. However, in the next column, we see a really interesting scene. You see here, uh, two women, and they've got a rope around another woman's uh, neck. And um, that, other, excuse me, that other woman is, is Vashti. And according to the rabbis, Vashti, and you, you see her crown is on the floor here, you see? 
uh, that's another indication that this Vashti. And according to the rabbis, Vashti was actually quite evil. She did all sorts of terrible things uh, to Jewish women, made them work on Shabbos and other things. And as such, not only was she dismissed from the court, as is indicated in the um, Esther scroll, but she is also um, actually killed. And sometimes we see her killed uh, by strangulation here. And sometimes uh, she's seen beheaded when, when the narrative includes uh, other imagery. Here we have another very interesting scene. You see a man and he's shooting arrows and he's shooting arrows um, at, a, at a circle and the circle has signs of the zodiac. And this relates to the story where Haman did not know um, what uh, what uh, month in which to kill the Jews? He's kind of, he says, well, what would be the most auspicious time to kill the Jews? So he peeled poor. He, he we say he he, he 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 had lots. He played lots, but we don't actually know what these lots are. It seems that poor, um, in the Babylonian term, might be cubes or dice. Here, uh, the rabbis have a story where they say that he took a wheel and he put the signs of the zodiac, and each sign of the zodiac is indicative of a different month. And he shot an arrow at it, and the arrow landed on uh, the month of Adar, which here is symbolized on top by two fish, Pisces is the month of Adar, and you see it on top over here, right? Do you see it on top or do you see something which says that you are sharing screen? Abigail, is that, like, does the share screen show up on yours or just on mine? That's just looking, your screen. Uh, it's just on mine, okay, that's fine. I just wanna make sure you're seeing the right screen. So, so, so this is something that only someone who was very well-versed in rabbinic midrash and narrative would have known to include in, in, in the illustrations. And it's quite wonderful that it's included here. Um, the last scene over here is a scene of the hanging of Haman's 10 sons. And what I want to point out to you is the artist has illustrated a crowd below of onlookers. And you see this enlarged here. But look at the crowd. It's a group of Jews dressed in 18th century dress. This is Ashkenazic 18th century dress. The man here is wearing what's known as a barretta. Uh, it's a flat cap that was worn by Ashkenazi Jews. Um, probably an indicator that the patron um, uh, who commissioned this was Ashkenazi. Um, for many years, it was a discussion about whether these were produced in Germany uh, because of this dress or in Amsterdam. But um, long story, it, it, there was one, I'll tell you the story. Um, nobody knew where these were printed and it went back and forth between Amsterdam and Germany. Um, and finally, one appeared on the market printed on paper. Um, because these are all printed on parchment, because it's only kosher if it's printed on parchment. And when the one appeared on paper uh, at auction, uh, one of the scholars had the brilliant idea to watermark the paper, and the watermark was Dutch. So we know that these are now printed in Amsterdam. It's kind of an interesting way that the makeup of the scroll contributed to how we know um, where they were printed. Um, moving right along, um, the question is, who are the artists of the scroll? Very few scrolls, even when they're signed by the scribe, on very few scrolls do we know who the artist was. We know that Shalom d'Italia was the artist of the scroll we saw a couple of minutes ago. Um, but we, we assume that most of these scrolls are illustrated by Jews. In, and, and this is interesting because um, although few are signed, there's a lot of research going on now that's beginning to reveal the existence of artistic workshops whereby Jews were creating both decorated, um, illustrated ketubot, marriage contracts, and in the same style, decorated megillot. And I wanna give you an example uh, uh, based on a, a Hebrew Union College uh, scroll here. Um, this is a scroll that gives you an example. It does have uh, a, um, an inscription which tells you who wrote it, but it doesn't, he doesn't say uh, where he's from and he doesn't say where the art was done. So um, take a look at this scroll, all right? You see this sort of very emblematic uh, red and blue uh, decoration, right? With the birds over here. And now look, uh, look at this, okay? And um, these are two ketubot and both of these ketubot were created in Ancona. Ancona was a center of design for this red and blue decorative device. Um, at right, we see Ketubah in the Bruginsky collection uh, from Ancona from 1795. Uh, at left, we see Ketubah from 
Ancona in another private collection from 1767. Um, actually, the groom from the Ketubat left is a member of the Pacifico family. This will be interesting in a minute. And one of the witnesses is a member of the Nachman family. These are both families, important families, who live in Ancona. Um, so, a little bit more about this scroll. The scroll that I showed you a minute ago uh, begins with a, a family emblem, okay? And it turns out that it's the family emblem of the Pacifico family. And we know this uh, because of what he writes at the end. This is a little colophon at the end, a little paragraph at the very end of the scroll. And the scribe writes, um, Megilaze zo nase mehatzair Shimon Pacifico, um, and he says he wrote it in Shvat, uh, and he gives the exact date, um, five thousand uh, five hundred and uh, twenty-two, which equals seventeen sixty-two. So we know the date of this scroll. Um, but um, the, there's a blessing sheet that accompanies this scroll, which adds another whole layer of ownership and mystery. And here's the blessing sheet in the very same style. Okay. And the blessing sheet has a different family emblem and a different name. So it's kind of amusing. Um, here, let's see. If you look here in the corners, it's, it's kind of actually hard to see. All right. You don't have to take my word for it. Uh, unless maybe I can blow it up. I don't, I don't think I can actually. But um, the name over here is Yehoshua ben Yosef Nachman, okay? So this is the Nachman coat of arms, and it's a bird uh, sort of on the edge of a, um, a lamp that's hanging on three chains. So um, the scroll maybe was written by uh, uh, Pacifico and then for himself and then gifted or bought by uh, Yehoshua ben Yosef Chai Nachman, and uh, they created a blessing sheet uh, with, uh, with, his, um, with his own information and coat of arms. So I want to close this lecture with two much more modern Megillot, one from the beginning of the 20th century and another from the beginning of the 21st century. And here you're looking at another scroll in the HUC library, and it is very dramatically illustrated by Otto Gesmar. And Gesmar, and it was published in Berlin in 1936. And Otto Gesmar, uh, who was born in 1873 and uh, lived until 1957, uh, was active as an art teacher at the Jewish Community School in Berlin. And he lived in Berlin for more than three decades, um, from 1904 to 1936. In 1930, he actually went to visit Palestine. He stayed there for a few months and decided to go back to Berlin. Um, but in 1939, he and his wife fled Germany and moved to Brazil, where he lived until the 50s. While he was in Berlin in 1936, uh, he created this Megillat Esther, and he uses a style known as Jugendstil, which is the German decorative style parallel to Art Nouveau, and has very simple, strong lines where he draws the characters uh, by means of their bodily contours. And here you're looking at the opening feasts uh, a drunken merriment um, at, uh, at top, and uh, Achashverosh feast is at top, Vashi's feast is below, um, the dancing girls, and here we have scribes already beginning to write uh, to all the nations saying, um, you, you absolutely must follow the rules of your husband uh, and obey whatever he says after Vashti does not obey um, Achashverosh. Um, going on to the next image here, we see um, Haman filled with anger as Mordechai leaning against a column refuses to bow down to him. And Haman is, um, is on the bottom here, uh, throwing lots to determine the date of the destruction of the Jewish people. Now, um, in the same year that the scroll was printed, likely mere weeks after it was published, on March 7th of 1936, Shabbat, Erev Purim, Shabbat Parshat Zachar, Hitler sent German troops marching into the Rhineland, a demilitarized zone around the, along the Rhine River in Western Germany. This action directly contravened the Treaty of Versailles and changed the balance of power by allowing Germany to pursue a policy of aggression in Western Europe that had been blocked by the demilitarized status of the Rhineland. 
The fact that Britain and France did not intervene made Hitler believe that neither country would get in the way of Nazi foreign policy and made him decide actually to quicken the pace of German preparations for war. It was absolutely a terrifying time for the Jews of Germany. On most Esther scrolls, there are two main images that you see. One is Haman leading the horse on which Mordechai uh, rides through the city. And the other is the hanging of Haman's 10 sons and Haman on the gallows. And it's worth noting um, that in this scroll, what you see is a bunch of people looking on, but um, the artist Otto Gesmar omitted the gallows. And Rachel Wischnitzer, who was one of the leading scholars of Jewish art in the 20th century, who lived in Germany as well, pointed out that Gesmeyer probably left it out for political reasons. She felt that the Jews of Germany were in such a precarious situation that Gesmeyer did not want to give the Nazis any ammunition to be able to say that the Jews killed members of the host nation. Like, look at their biblical book. Um, to anybody here like listening on, we never stop to think about this. Um, in the story of Esther, do you know how many of the Jews' enemies were killed? Anyone have any idea? You can write it in the chat. Um, 75,000. It's a large number. It kind of gets glossed over like the beauty pageants. Um, there are a lot of people being killed in that, in that story by the Jews. And Otto Gesmeyer does not want to emphasize that in his scroll. Um, I want to end with a more uplifting scroll. And this is a scroll created in the, I guess it was about two, three years ago by Avner Maria. Uh, it's an extraordinary example of a modern illustrated Esther scroll. And Avner was educated in the B'Tselel Academy of Art and in Yale University. He's an Israeli. And he continues the tradition of illustrating Megillot. And he has composed a rich visual narrative which animates uh, the biblical story of Esther. Um, Mariah's vibrantly colored and theatrical tableaus really dramatically transport the viewer into the excitement of the Purim tale. And you can see here uh, the imagery of the parties. Um, Ahasuerus is lifting his goblet. People are falling down dead drunk. Uh, the girls are dancing. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's a really a rich, colorful mosaic of imagery and styles. He's drawing both upon the styles of the ancient Near East, as well as the um, perspective of the European Renaissance to tell the story of the ancient Persian court. Um, here you see here uh, the scene where Ahasuerus is, um, is um, lying in bed and he is, uh, actually, let me do that, sorry. And he's being read to when he can't sleep that night. It's the turning point of the story. You see a Haman with his family as his wife tells him, hey, you should go and construct a gallows. And so in fact, he goes off to do that. Um, and here you see Haman as he leads uh, Mordechai through the streets of Shushan, um, as all of the people are watching. Uh, Avner has actually included one of the uh, extra biblical tales in Midrash where the daughter of Haman empties a pot of slop on her uh, father's head by accident. She thinks it's gonna be Mordechai here and her, her father on the horse, but in fact, it's the opposite case. Um, and, uh, this is, it's a really uh, exceptional and superb example of the contemporary retelling of the Esther story. And I wanted to um, show you the last two slides uh, just to emphasize what uh, Yoram has mentioned. Um, HUC was one of the very earliest, the earliest uh, to put their Migilot online. You can go to their website and explore all of their scrolls or many of their scrolls uh, in, in, in detail, they're all there. You just click on them and there they are. And it's really been a pleasure to explore some of the highlights of the Megillot in the HSC collection. Um, there's so many interesting examples. You can see many more on the portal and learn the art creativity and artistic endeavors of Jewish scribe artists uh, through the window of decorated Megillot Esther for the last four centuries. And I really thank you um, for uh, allowing me this time to share these Mikilot with you. Thank you very much. And I think we do have some time for questions and I will unshare the screen so um, you, can, you can decide how to handle the questions. 
So thank you, Sharon, for your really fascinating and interesting lecture. Every time we learn a lot. So, and again, I want to encourage you to visit our uh, beautiful uh, website and take a look. We have around 60 plus megalot that you can, uh, I don't know, spend a couple of hours, read and uh, read the uh, description and look on the uh, beautiful illus uh, illustration. So, and uh, again, it's, they are really, really beautiful megalot. So please take a look. So now we have some time for questions. So, uh, Avigail, do you want to take the questions? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll start off. Uh, let's go with what some of the more recent ones first. Uh, the, we have a question about who are the other female illustrators of Miggy Lote? Oh, you're muted, Sharon. The way that we know of the two other uh, Esther schools, let me see if I can have that quickly, is because we have blessing sheets uh, with their names on them. And if I can find it really, really quickly, I will find it for you, um, but I can't. So I, I'm happy, I, I will give you my email and I will give you their names. Um, we don't know anything about them. We just know that there are two other blessing sheets signed uh, with the names of, of women. And I will have that information handy for the next time. If I can Google it, if I can find it in my notes really quickly, I will, I will do it. Otherwise I'll send it to you. My email is shmints at gmail.com. You're, you're welcome to ask me that question directly. Uh, so we have another question here about the artwork and the text. Um, I think that you mentioned this at some point, but uh, how often were, was the scribe also the illustrator? That's a really good question. Um, we think a lot of the time, it seems to us that when um, book production moves from a uh, manuscript to, to printing, um, book production in, in, in handwritten form goes down dramatically. Um, there's still books being produced by hand, Kabbalistic books, calendrical books are still produced by hand. Um, prayer books uh, in the 18th century are being produced by hand and decorated. And we know that at that time, um, in the, in the 17th and 18th century, the scribes that were creating these books were also the artists. We, we believe, although most of them are unsigned, that in almost all of the cases, the artists um, were Jews and, and probably the same person as a scribe. We, we can't prove it, um, but in the, in the way that we see that the uh, Megillot and Ketubot are so similar. It's probably the same person writing the Ketubah and decorating it was also writing and decorating the Megillot. There's more work to be done on this. Okay, great. Um, another question. Somebody asked, which came first, the architectural motifs in the scrolls or in the ritual objects? Ah, that's a good question. Um, well, uh, the scroll that we saw from HUC was 1606. Um, that was the earliest one with a really obvious architectural motif that I know of. The two from the uh, 16th century, um, it's sort of arcades, but it's not, well, I guess that is architectural imagery. Um, if we go back to look at the scroll of Estelina, we have the caryatids, which are, which are architectural imagery. I can bring that up again, if you like, um, it was the very first scroll that I showed. So if we're gonna count that as the first one of 1564, I guess the printed book still comes first because the printed books first show up as 1522-23. So I'd say that it first appears in printed books and then goes on to the Esther Scrolls. But I guess it's possible that there were other illustrated ones that just we don't have anymore. Lorraine and Oriah, because we don't see it, we, we, we can't, we can't, we, we don't know, yeah. Um, and kind of related, uh, we had a few questions about the coloring of the manuscripts. At what point did they start in, including color in the illustrations? Well, that was very early on. I mean, the very first scroll by Stalina in 1564 um, is, is, is colored. Um, and then um, maybe what you're asking is about the engraved borders. And so yeah, the engraved right. borders are black and white, uh, but we do have examples of hand colored engraved borders. In other words, first they'd engrave them. And if you have a, a, a scribe artist who was proficient, they would hand color them. So at the time that they were created, uh, the, the, first, the first engraved scrolls 
were, um, let's see, I guess it would be Shalom d'Italia in, well, okay, no. The first engraved borders created as engraved borders would be Shalom d'Italia scrolls of 1641. We did see the earlier one, but that wasn't created for Esther scroll purposes. So I don't know of any Shalom d'Italia scrolls that are hand colored, but by the middle of the 17th century, um, HUC does have examples of Italian scrolls from the 17th century, which are engraved and then hand colored. So certainly by the 17th century that's happening, say 1760s. Okay, and a question about the vocalization or the punctuation. Do the Est Esther scrolls ever have Nikud on them? Almost never. Almost never. That's unlike with uh, the Sephardi Sifrei Torah, that, which usually do include the punctuation. Yeah. Okay. Uh, somebody asked, is, since Esther scrolls do not have God's name, are they allowed to be thrown away uh, and do not need to be go to Giza? Uh, no, no, um, they definitely need to be put in Geniza. Um, just because they do, don't have God's name, it doesn't mean that they don't have a level of Kedusha. And in fact, even things that are printed in Hebrew, things that go into the Geniza, uh, uh, strictly speaking, the Rebbe Kedusha, Dvarim Shabbat Kedusha, things that have holiness, don't necessarily have to have God's name. You could have a Sidur and have a paragraph without God's name, or a, a Bible and a paragraph without God's name, but that certainly needs Geniza. So yeah, those have to be put in the Geniza. Okay, great. Uh, sorry, there's so many assorted comments here. Uh, but this one also is related to the name of God. Hold on one moment. Uh, somebody wanted to know when the illuminating of the Megillot began um, and what media were used. So are the, the printed scrolls are our very first examples of illumination, but that's all that we know. We don't know. There, there's no historical record of anything that was done beforehand, is there? Um, I, what do you mean by that more specifically? I guess this, this person was asking if we know like what the very first kind of illustration was done for the Megillot. Um, the very first one was that Stellina scroll, 1564. Right, but I guess what? the question are there any external references to any other kinds of illustrated Megillot? No, no, that's a good oh, question. Using proof that the, very proof in other words, when do, when do the rabbis pick up on this? Maybe like when, do, when is there any sort of external discussion? I found Chuvot, um, rabbinic responsive from the 18th century, talking about whether one should or should not include uh, illustration in Megillot Esther. Um, but they, they, there's no, there's, and there is some rabbinic response to talking about printing a scroll and whether a printed scroll is kosher. The answer is no. Um, um, but I, um, but we don't find discussion about decorations. If that's, is that, is that what you're asking a little bit? And I see also that someone asked, I'm looking at some of the chats now, there are a lot of them. If uh, Stelina is, um, is close to Esther, could that have been a pen name? And the answer is Stelina is a common name. Uh, uh, amongst um, uh, Jewish women of Italy, it's not so unusual. So no, I don't think that was a pen name. Um, other questions that you that you found? Uh, I think that we are going to wrap it up for questions. We just had one more um, slide to share over here. And uh, I do want to mention that the Keeping It Sacred community and anybody who would like to join is going to have a breakout room shortly. Uh, so I think you'll see that option pop up on your screen if you're part of that community or would like to join them. Uh, we do want to thank our sponsors for supporting this program, including the U.S. Bank. And they sponsor this program and the other lectures in the HUC Connect series. And lastly, if you would like to donate in order to support these programs and help sustain the mission of HUC, which is preparing the next generation of Jewish leaders for communities throughout North America, Israel, and the world. So please check out the donate.huc.edu slash connect. And I just want to thank Sharon again for this really, really exciting presentation and for all of the guests that joined us today. Thank you. So thank you, Sharon. And please uh, uh, join, join us for the next lecture that it's on March 1st. So thank you and good afternoon. Pleasure. Take care. Bye, everybody. Chag Sameach. Thank you, Sharon. Bye. Sameach, everybody. Thank you very much. Chag Sameach. Thanks, Sharon. Thank you.